Toby Perkins, uh, Labour MP for Chesterfield since 2010, now uh, a Shadow Education Minister. Let's start by talking about your education, actually. You're one of the few MPs who didn't go to university. I mean, I think, I think what's more important is the contribution people make rather than what they, uh, their background is. But I think that it does give you a different perspective. I was on a YTS scheme at the age of 17. Um, what were you training to be? In, in salesperson, basically. I was in telephone sales uh, in the IT industry and, and stayed in that for sort of seven years. Um, I have came, come on the back of um, sort of both my parents having been academics. Um, but also uh, my mum, uh, after my parents split up, having sort of pretty uh, tough time being out of work and so on. Um, and, and I think it was just maybe my response to, to what I'd seen and, and also just who I was at that point. You know, I wanted to get away from studying and school and wanted to get into to an adult environment, really. Your marriage broke down in 2018. You fell in love and started a relationship with someone who was employed as a member of your staff. It got in the papers, got a fair amount of negative um, press attention for you. It must have been very hard for everybody involved. I mean, it was. I think when it came into the press, um, it actually already happened a few months before. Um, but you manage in really difficult situations. I was managing really difficult situations. It was just after Christmas, the first Christmas I spent with my kids. So you, you know, you all your focus is on the people who are suffering around you. It's not, a, you know, it wasn't about me personally. Um, but I was very conscious of, you know, my kids had already um, been through a tough situation. Amanda's kids have been through a tough situation. That's your current partner. Uh, yeah, and, and the, you know, the last thing I wanted was to, um, to sort of bring everybody who was you know, already in pain uh, into the sort of public eye in that way. And there's also, you know, whilst the, the sort of the main headline uh, might be true, there's numerous inaccuracies in what's being reported. And so you, you do feel uh, very powerless, really, to, to sort of respond to uh, much of that. Um, and, and, you know, I was still very new into a relationship that was it was going great, but, you know, also feeling the pain of the, that it was causing other people. So it, it is incredibly difficult. And uh, it, it's obviously the, the downside of being in the public eye in that way. Are you OK now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm great. Uh, obviously, you know, still conscious of other people who have suffered. And I think it is difficult when, you know, on the one hand, I'm absolutely certain I did the right thing in terms of, you know, my own happiness. And, you know, I think that's important for those people around you. But, but you also are conscious, having, you know, been a child who went through a, um, their parents splitting up, you know, um, bringing that to, to the door of my and Amanda's uh, families, you know, was, was really difficult. And you talk about, um, you, you were married and you were married for a long time and you have a son and a daughter. Um, but early in your, 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 your marriage, um, you and your wife lost twins. Tell us about that. Do you ever get over something like that? Well, I mean, so we were married in, in 1996. Um, within a few months of, of being married, uh, my wife was pregnant. We were told uh, that she was expecting twins, you know, tremendously exciting. Um, the, you know, you go and have the scan when you discover not only, you know, not only got one, but you've got two. Um, and then in January, she was in poor health uh, for a lot of the, uh, for a lot of that month. And, you know, we, we ended up going back for a scan sort of to check if everything was okay, if her poor health had had a, an impact. Um, and then we get told um, that we can only find one heartbeat. And, you know, you realise that this means that, you know, a baby's died. And I guess at that moment you sort of think, well, all right, we've still got one. But actually, you know, the reality is very quickly uh, my ex-wife's uh, body uh, kind of gave birth to the, the dead child, my son Joshua. And within a few moments, you know, gave birth to uh, my daughter, uh, Jennifer, who was, who was alive. Um, but 
was only 23 weeks into the pregnancy. I think nowadays might be more of a chance of, uh, of survival, but we had about six hours uh, with her and, and then she died also. Um, and I think, you know, the, the two things that really will always stay with me from that is, is the first, is that moment when you, you first hear. Uh, and the second is, you know, walking into the church that five months before I'd been married in with two tiny coffins in my arms. Um, and, you know, the, the wail I remember that came from my mother seeing her son uh, with her two grandchildren, you know, in, in his arms. Um, it, it, it's obviously it's something that no one, you would never want anyone to, to suffer. Um, and, you know, there's a part of you that has that, goes through that grief. And, um, you know, a little bit of you sort of dies in that moment. Um, and, and, you know, immediately my ex-wife was very ill. So we, we had, you know, a short sort of period of time where the focus was on, on her health. Um, and, and obviously, you know, coming to, you know, attempting to come to terms with what had happened. But I think we were also both of the view that we wanted to conceive again. Um, and within 12 months of, uh, of my uh, twins dying, our twins dying, uh, we, we, um, my son was born. Um, in fact, his due date was exactly a year on from, from the, the birth date of, of my twins. That wasn't actually when he was born. So, you know, we were obviously heartbroken that the twins had died. We were blessed that my son was born. Um, you know, a terrible thing happened, a great thing happened, the great thing wouldn't have happened if the terrible thing hadn't have happened. And so you take solace from that. And, uh, you know, it's, I think, you know, in terms of the resilience that y you need to show and, and in terms of the way that we responded, you know that, you know, to an extent there's nothing to be scared of again. You're never going to maybe have grief like that again. So... It, it is, um, it's, it's incredibly tough, but, you know, human beings are remarkably resilient and, and you come through. If anybody is watching who might have had a, an experience like the one that you and your ex-wife went through, is there any advice you can give? I think everyone, everyone just finds their own way. Um, you know, some people will uh, need to sort of spend you know, a lot of time um, and, and sort of repeatedly in, in years uh, going forward acknowledging it. Others will, will handle it in a different way and I don't think anyone can tell anyone else how they should handle it. Everyone sort of finds their own way. But I think it's the same thing I'd say about any grief, you know, losing a parent um, or any other, is that, you know, the, the acuteness of the grief will pass. Um, but that's as much as I can say, really. You know, and I think, I think for us, and uh, you know, we're in a better position than, than some others, in so much as you know, fundamentally there was no reason why my ex-wife couldn't have more children. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know, people going through this who, who've had miscarriage after miscarriage, and, and uh, you know, it's all the more uh, possibly brutal for them. But, um, yeah, we say so my son was born, um, and then a few years later we adopted my daughter, um, and uh, it, you know it was uh, so life goes on. Thank you for speaking so so openly. I think it will help people. It's hard to listen to. Never mind, mm. go through. Um, another thing I noticed about you, I noticed a, a few months uh, ago, you've got a hearing aid. Have you always had a hearing aid? Did I just, because we were in the same intake when we, we got elected at the same time, and I never noticed it. Is that just me uh, being a typical self absorbed uh, member of parliament who doesn't notice anything else about your DL? Um, maybe. Uh, I think, I mean, so I've, I've had hearing aids virtually throughout my time in, in parliament. Um, I mean, I first noticed I was going deaf in my early 20s, right. and uh, all that I've got a hearing loss, I should say. And um, I, I really. It, there was a moment where it was really sort of getting worse quickly. And I remember in my mid-twenties at some point just kind of praying 
that I might be able to function into my mid thirties. Although I can get to thirty five, where I can still hear, can still work. You know, I was envisaging, you know, being invalided out and, and not being able to work. Um, and I thought if I can just have a few years, where I can put food on the table. You know, um, but it, it, you know, wasn't that bad. Um, it did sort of stop escalating, and, and it's fluctuated a bit over the years. Um, but it is difficult in Parliament. You all know that Parliament's a very kind of whispery yeah. uh, workplace and it's a very noisy workplace. Uh, and, and there's a lot of kind of walking and talking and uh, a lot of kind of under the breath uh, conversations. And I, and I find that difficult. Um, and I think one of the things, you know, that maybe... Was, was part of Amanda and I coming together was that when she was working closely with me to so the extent to which she became my ears and you know, one of the things that where it really um, it poses an issue is a lot of MPs will go to schools and do kind of uh, this is what an MP is and I love doing those absolutely fantastic but uh, I find little seven year olds at the back of the room pretty tough to hear um, and so you know I, you, you'll get someone asking a question and, and you know one of the worst things about being deaf is you ask someone to repeat something once that's fine when it's second three times uh, you're asking someone to repeat it um, it gets embarrassing for you it's embarrassing for them and so eventually you, you just kind of pretend you've heard and and she you know she was great uh, in, in that regard is great in that regard and, and I think it was one of the things that kind of um, maybe uh, brought, brought about that connection um, but it is you know it's a disability it's a it's a difficult one because sometimes people think you're being ignorant because they think you've ignored them uh, or people think you're stupid because you're answering a different question to one they've asked you um, so you know I have you know huge sympathy for for everyone who uh, is deaf and uh, and it's you know there's also much more of a stigma about it people are really fine about wearing glasses yeah um but wearing hearing aids it's, we, we start much more uh sort of shy about that and so um yeah I'm, I'm kind of in a way glad that you didn't notice in another way you sort of think people might you know maybe it'd be better if they did notice you know you've covered a lot of ground there um you've been very open i've really enjoyed listening to you uh thank you toby i really do feel like we've learned um the real toby perkins today thank you all right. Thanks very much. Cheers.